So I'm writing a novel. It's the show where you join me, Oliver Brackenbury, on the journey of writing my next novel, from first ideas all the way to publication and promotion. In this unique one-man reality show, I'll share with you my ever-evolving thoughts and feelings on how I write, being a writer, and everything that entails at each stage of the process. I'll also answer listener questions and, sometimes, interview people who write fiction. If you're the kind of person who likes to learn how things are made and get to know the people making them, then this is the show for you. Last time, I had a lot to cover as I was introducing myself, the podcast, the basic idea for the novel, and defining the genre, as well as my relationship to it. That novel is still called Untitled Sword and Sorcery Novel. (laughs) And I would like to stress, you don't have to be a fan of sword and sorcery in order to enjoy this show, though you may become a fan over the course of it. And if I mention a name, uh, like an author or a a novel or something that you're not familiar with, I'll explain why it's relevant if that's necessary. Otherwise, it's just something fun that you've learned about which you can look up independently if you so choose. The contents of the novel are a little unusual in that instead of chapters, it's going to be told in a series of short stories, which is what you call a short story cycle, which is where you follow a single character through their entire life, or maybe just a period of their life, as told in a bunch of like independent, standalone short stories that add up to a greater work. If that's what I'm doing, then I better think pretty hard about the character we're going to be following. Her name is... Vo, V-O-E. That's a mononym for now, though if it makes sense to give her a last name at some point, I'm still open to that. I took her name from a beautiful book called Landmarks by Robert McFarlane, which is a collection of very specific words for various bits and pieces of the land and waters of the UK. Language played a very important part in the short story that birthed both Vo and my desire to write this novel, so I wanted the various unfamiliar words to feel of a kind, and I think if I just smashed syllables together, results would have been pretty unimpressive. I am not Tolkien, I don't have a degree in linguistics, so instead I turned to this book and looked exclusively at words from the Shetland Islands. Vo is a Shetland word meaning inlet or arm of the sea. Thinking about her physical strength and the fact that her mother is a blacksmith and she also knows some smithing, plus, you know, growing up on an island. I don't know, arm of the sea. I, I just really like that. It feels very romantic. I also just like the sound, though. It's kind of pleasurable to say, and I think it sounds suitably like the name of a hero in a sword and sorcery story, even though most sword and sorcery characters I'm familiar with have names with two or three syllables. Conan, Kothar, Elric, Fafur, Jirel, Ojuri, Imaro, and so on. By comparison to them, though feels kind of humble, which I'm here for given the very humble working class kind of vibe that birthed her uh, originally. Honestly, Vo is a character who arguably I have written variations of two times before. It, really, the absolute ground zero for me thinking about Vo was me looking at Norman Rockwell's painting, Rosie the Riveter. We've all seen it uh, with her big rivet gun across her legs, sort of powerful arms and whatnot uh, underneath a jumpsuit. And uh, yeah, just kind of looking pretty chill while she eats her lunch. It must be nine or ten years ago now, I remember looking at the painting and just having a very powerful feeling of wanting to know her better, to see her in action, to, you know, her, her daily routines, like in a sense, started bubbling up in my head, or of course, my imagination of her daily routines, and so on and so forth. This went into the soup along with a whole bunch of other stuff I was thinking about when I decided to write the script for a horror film called Knife Factory. In it, Rosalind, as Rosie became, was a pivotal character who looked more or less like she did in the painting, maybe even bigger and stronger as that was very important, her physical strength as well as her moral strength. And she was kind of the villain you can root for, a sympathetic villain, in a story about essentially a kind of Flint, Michigan-ish, near-future town where, you know, Amazon, in quotation marks, has started to kill Walmart, in quotation marks, which in turn has long been killing all the decent jobs, anything with a union or what have you, in that town, except for the titular knife factory. When it sounds like maybe the factory will be sold and dismantled, workers, led by their foreman, Rosalind, use what they think is an ancient ritual involving blood sacrifice 
to try and secure indefinite job security. Yeah. So Rosalind, she's big, physically strong, you know, working class, and makes things with her hands. She's also caring, capable of violence, and a little naive. This was one of my earliest screenplays, and like most screenplays, it did not get produced. Oh well. A few years go by, and I'm working on my first novel, Junkyard Leopard, which stars a young woman named Mary who definitely carries some traits over. You know, she's tall but not big, because that's the physical side, I guess. She's no Rosie the Riveter in that sense. And she's very naive, overwhelmed easily, mentally unwell, really, traumatized by capitalism. But like Rosalind, she's working class and suffers from actual economic anxiety. Uh, we, that phrase has been so polluted, unfortunately. But yeah, she's genuinely very concerned about her finances and her future that way. And her serial killing alter ego certainly is also a creature of violence. Both Rosalind and the figure are quite happy to use brute violence to resolve some issues. And of course, also, this is another horror story. Lucky me, this novel gets published, and people read it. Hurrah! And if you want to get your own copy, <laughs> just put Junkyard Leopard into Amazon, and you should be able to find it in softcover and ebook formats. So yeah, that's cool. Okay, and that got out into the world, that, that you know sort of filtered expression of Rosie the Riveter in my mind. So I'm done, right? Well, that's what I figure. For a while, I focus on very different characters and other stories for a while. But then in June of 2019, I want to write a sword and sorcery short story. And I'm seeing like a dirty thief kind of character. And I want to give him an opposite number who's very different to him. And oh, there she is again. A Rosie the Riveter type wanders into my field of view. Except this time, she's very young, like Mary. And she's very big and physically strong and present, like Rosie the Riveter, like Rosalind in Knife Factory. And I just kind of sketched some stuff down uh, off the top of my dome. Uh, she's impatient. She's a warrior, a thrill seeker, an athlete, uh, daring. She's a carouser. She uh, needs an exciting reason to do something. And maybe as a nod to Conan, uh, I make her a blacksmith's daughter, because I read in one of the stories that he was a blacksmith's son, although I forget which one it was. And... Yeah, uh, whatever, let's just go, man. Let's, let's not overthink it too hard. Especially since Rosalind didn't actually make it out into the world, really. Only if maybe a couple dozen people ever read that story. And Mary, this isn't Mary. This isn't uh, timid or whatever, or a psychopath murderer on the other side there. You know, this is someone very, very different, full of adventure and self-determination. This is a sword and sorcery hero, which is being designed almost entirely in opposition to the thief character. You know, he's a homebody. She wants to travel. You know, he's very cynical. She's very not. Yeah, okay, sure. Uh, let's, let's go with it. I think we can go back to Rosie the Riveter one more time. And when I'm writing the short story, I, I choose to really discover her more through the writing of the story. I don't write much down in the notebook. I'm looking at it here. You know, age, uh, 27. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. That changed. Um, ethnicity. I don't know. Anglo Caucasian, Northern UK. Sure. Hair, rust colored. Why not? Uh, all muscles and freckles, tall, broad shoulders, built like a blacksmith, fingers of a weaver. Oh, okay. So her dad was going to be a weaver, I guess. That's my idea there. Uh, eyes each a different color, green and blue. Oh, okay. Learned both her parents' trades, heard many old stories, and inflamed her imagination. Then I wrote a heading, religion, and blank. <laughs> and across from that is a blank page. Yeah, I chose not to get too crazy into defining her before I wrote the short story, because I, I think I just had this powerful urge to just get writing, and that happens sometimes. But really, I'm the kind of guy who needs to do some outlining before he writes a story. Bless the William Gibsons of the world who can just remove everything from the block of clay that isn't the statue. I am not that person. And I would argue sometimes William Gibson, he's amazing. I love him. I have all of his books, but his endings feel a little, uh, you know, and it's over. <laughs> so maybe, maybe outlining has its pluses and minuses. So yeah, I do a lot of work on outlining the story, but at this point in my writing, I, it's weird. With my screenplays, I always start by figuring out, after the initial idea of premise, I guess, uh, figuring out the characters and everything comes out of that. Strangely, I had yet to start doing that with my stories uh, in prose. So yeah, I write the story, get a first draft or two out, it's having a little trouble with it, whatever. And I realize part of the trouble I'm having is I don't really know the protagonist as well as I could. 
around this time, I see online someone share the Proust questionnaire, which is like 35 questions you ask, you know, that are like, what is your greatest fear? What is the trait you most deplore in yourself? What is the trait you most deplore in others? And so on. So I try answering those questions in the headspace of what I imagine Vo is. And that helps, you know, it helps, uh, you know, what, get things like, what do you consider is the most overrated virtue? Patience. Okay, she's impatient. This certainly helped, and I do recommend it. It's a fun exercise, but it's, I would argue, not enough, you know, especially if you're going to commit to writing that character for an entire novel, which I did when, you know, January 2020 rolled around. Having written her in the short story, I felt like I knew Vo pretty well. So the first six months of spare time that I had to work on this were mostly spent on figuring out genre stuff and what kind of stories I wanted to tell with her. But then I sort of sat down in June of 2020 and thought to myself, oh boy, yeah, I need to really formalize this. I really need to know her better. And then I have found out in writing the short story, in scribbling some stuff in the corners of that page I mentioned, and doing that prowess questionnaire. Let's really put this together. And to help me with that, I turned to a writing book. I, I'm not, I always have a contentious relationship with writing books because there's still a little immature part of me that hates the idea of formalizing writing. Like it should just be magical and it should shoot out of your butt whenever you need it. But that's silly. Uh, just as silly as going to the other extreme and assuming that everything has to be super mega formal and it's just like math and there's only 12 kinds of stories or whatever, which like I have an extreme distaste for that. So yeah, I let's just say I'm picky when it comes to books on writing, on how you should write. That book is called Creating Unforgettable Characters, and it's written by Linda Seeger. And yeah, it sort of has a little more of a focus on film and TV, I think, than novels and short stories. However, really, it's applicable to anything, I think. So I crack open the denim notebook and I write down some basic stuff. You know, her age, starting age, which is 19. Once again, ethnicity, uh, you know, hair, eyes, none of that changes from earlier. You know, sort of the basic appearance of her. Yeah, all muscles and freckles still, you know, tall, broad shoulders, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Shade over six foot two. Rosie the Riveter, I literally write that down. Also in pencil, I see I put slight underbite, question mark. <laughs> and then I put a quote from creating unforgettable characters, which is this. I think you define characters by putting them into situations that force them to open up to a new dynamic. You can't put a character on stage and let her state what she's all about. That's externalizing. The more successful way of developing characters is actually to create a situation in which they have to react, and the way they react is the way you get to know them. Uh, that is a quote from Diane English on page 61 of Creating Unforgettable Characters by Linda Seeger. Underneath that, I also put a very short quote from someone else. What does it say here? When I look at characters, I look at them with the supposition that perfect logic is dull. That was Dale Wasserman, screenwriter of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. So yeah, reminding myself of a couple of real good truths when it comes to character, which is that having someone just, you know, exposition you their whole deal is boring. It's much more interesting to learn by watching them do stuff. And of course, a character who is quote unquote perfect and only does things that make perfect sense is boring. Good to remember. Then I just put down, what do I know in my heart off the top of my head about Vo? You know, before I even get into the formal stuff, I just wrote down, you know, she's confident, physical, loves and respects craft, is an amateur craftsperson, has serious wanderlust bordering on FOMO, <laughs> loves legends, believes strongly in a just world way of seeing things at the start, isn't pious but is religious, and cares about personal growth. Yeah, that's all just stuff I threw off the top of my head uh, slash kind of felt like I learned in the writing of the short story. Um, and yeah, and of course, I also know that she grew up in a remote Shetland-like island, is used to, therefore, cold, uh, high winds, and is fine with the sea at the level of, say, a fisherman as opposed to a sailor. She's not a barbarian, but she's rural, not a city girl. Oh, and she's impatient, and she cries freely, unashamed of emotion, is a little note I added in pencil. Not sure if I'll carry that forward. I just, I, you know, I kind of hate it when people feel the need to make women characters tough, so they literally, like, just act like toxic masculinity embodied in someone who was assigned female at birth. Plus, of course, I would also add that I feel there is a greater strength in being comfortable with your emotions and letting them just flow through you than uh, welding them up. Anywho, it would be exhausting if I read through every little thing I wrote down in the following pages, so instead I'm going to list for you with maybe the odd example 
the categories of sort of character to think about that are suggested by Linda Seeger. Starting with the paradox, things about the character which seem contradictory, you know, maybe a, a very violent person who in other times uh, can show great tenderness, that sort of thing. With the Vo, definitely it's the fact that she embodies a lot of stereotypically masculine traits, yet I want her to also be happy to mix in some femininity when she fancies it in the right setting. Then you have Vo's emotions, of course, all humans can have all emotions, pretty much, but uh, these are ones which tend to dominate the character or define them, you know. Uh, for example, Vo, I see her mostly being full of passion and vitality, you know. Uh, then we have Vo's attitudes, which change over the course of the book as we go through all these years of her life. I've definitely made notes for how she is in the middle and back end of the book. Uh, at the very front end, she trusts authority he figures, you know, reveres heroes and loves craftspeople like her recently deceased parents, like my very alive parents. So yeah, there's a bit of me in the character again. It all comes down to her dead parents shaping her, you know, their absence and what they taught her while alive. This is where her attitudes come from. Then we have Vo's values, you know, attitudes being like what she likes or dislikes, how she feels towards certain things. Her values being what she feels deeply in herself are, you know, good or wrong, just or unjust. And I know one thing that definitely came out of writing the short story was that acting in good faith is deeply important to her and people who act in bad faith are deeply wrong and flawed from her point of view, especially when she's young and wants to make everything in the world very black and white so she can make sense of it. Then we have Vo's details. Now, what do I mean by details in this context? Well, in her book, Linda Seeger says that, you know, details often come from the person's imperfections. So, you know, maybe you want to give someone, like, a detail that, like, they always pick their teeth and you don't take it any further than that. But maybe it comes from an imperfection, like the person is very fussy about their appearance, very worried how others see them. With the Vo, as she is at the beginning of the book, um, for about the first third, I decided, okay, well, what qualities what imperfections, whatever, could drive these details. Impatience, naive at first, prone to black and white thinking, and that led me down to, you know, perhaps her uh, details are that she tosses around heavy-handed judgments like candy, you know, all case closed, you know, or she always races ahead of a guide because she just wants to friggin' get there, that kind of thing. Then we come to a category that can be very contentious for writers, especially when you're starting out, which is backstory. Oh boy, how much backstory do you have to write? Do you need to know who the person's dentist was when they were 11? Do you need to write out like a basically a novel about them before you write the novel about them? No. <laughs> In short, you do not. Doing that kind of thing is creating a lot of extra work for yourself. Also, you might be caging yourself in so that it's harder for you to discover who the character is through the act of writing, just as the reader can discover through act of reading. Because, oh, I can't have her do X, Y, Z because I already wrote down in the background that she would never do that. Oh, no. You know, there's a quote from the book, Linda Seeger's book. You know, she says, as a developed writer, you must know certain things to get started but you discover who the character is by throwing them into situations. And that sense can better understand what a writer means when they say, oh, uh, the character revealed themselves over the course of the story. They just came to me. Like, they're probably not actually talking about sort of magical mana from heaven inspiration. They're talking about how, as they kept pushing the character forward into various situations, it allowed them to better understand, like, what they might do and to come up with ideas along the way. Vo is a sword and sorcery hero, moving forward into a series of sword and sorcery stories. So I especially do not feel the need to write out a huge backstory for her, as those kinds of characters don't ever really have them. I'm making a broad sweeping comment, but the big ones, yeah, you know, uh, not so much. Good old Conan, you know he came from the north from a place called Samaria. You learn a little bit about his religion at one point, which I'll get into in a second, and uh, not much else. Really? And that's fine. You know, you find out who he is by watching him move forward. With Vo, I know she's raised on stories. I know her parents are craftspeople. Her mom was a blacksmith, which is part of why I have Vo herself wield a hammer in war, as her mother did in craft. And she comes from this island, and, you know, the island shaped her a bit. So whatever, man, let's just keep going. We have psychology, which is more than just how did your parents shape you, but as it's written in Linda Seeger's book, it, you know, seems to mostly center around that. Uh, I've already discussed it with Vo here, you know, they told her stories, they taught her craft, and so on. Finally, we have religion. 
Now, I just mentioned Conan and, you know, the fact that he worships Krom or his people worship Krom. And, you know, he's all about self-reliance and being kind of an outsider. And so is his god who gives you life. What more do you want? He won't help you. Don't bother praying. It's up to you to figure out what you're doing with the life he gave you. What kind of religion could shape Vo into the person she is? I must admit, I don't entirely have an answer for that yet. I'm not even sure if religion will be a major part of her life. That's something I've decided to kind of kick the can down the road a little bit and figure out as I put her through stories where religion is more or less relevant. Though I do rather like the idea of a monotheistic, probably female god, you know, great gardener in the sky uh, kind of thing. I, I really like the idea of a god as a gardener and having that be an organizing metaphor for all the ways that things in the world do or do not make sense. Paradox, emotions, attitudes, values, details, background, psychology, and religion. There is more in Linda Seeger's book, which I continue to recommend. There is more you can write. Always there is more you can write. Certainly I've considered things like what is there of me in the character, what is there of other people I know in the character, or even things I've kind of lifted in my mind intentionally or unintentionally from other things I've read or seen in movies, which... As long as it's just like a little aspect here and there is fine. You're going to borrow or steal, as people like to say of all artists, uh, from other works. You can't help but be influenced by other things. Just don't, you know, plagiarize or copy-paste the whole shebang. There's also how Vo may evolve and how a lot of sword and sorcery heroes don't, which is kind of the appeal for some readers. That said, Fafford and Grey Mouser, of Fritz Leiber's characters, who are definitely, I think, two of the biggest ones in the genre, they get older and they change, especially in the last two books in their series. Do I like Vo? Yes. I don't think I have to, but it doesn't hurt. And am I rooting for her? Yes. Don't think I have to, but it doesn't hurt. One of the most complained about notes that screenwriters get is, can you make the character more likable? And I feel like there's a whole essay on that. However, in short, I would just remind anyone listening who's worried, oh, is my character I'm working on likable enough? Think about the 1180 billion times you have consumed a story starring someone you would never want to hang out with. Likable isn't the thing. Interesting, compelling, these are the things. And I think Vo is interesting and compelling, I hope. <laughs> okay, you can tell I got a little unsure there as I, now I'm saying this to an audience. God damn it, I know Vo is interesting and compelling, by which I mean I find her interesting and compelling, and that's good enough. You can always write more, you can always think more about what shapes your character. I could talk about this for 1,100 more hours, but I think we're good, both for the purposes of this podcast and for me taking Vo forward to learn more about her through the stories and situations I chuck her into. And that's really the thing, isn't it? You know, I just need to feel good enough about the character that I think, okay, I can come up with a reasonable answer to any situation she's in where I ask myself, what would she do in this situation? <laughs> Good, good, good. All right. Next time, speaking of situations and stories, I'm going to talk about how I sat down with my ideas for what I wanted to do with the genre and what I wanted to do with the character and mesh these things together to come up with, well, what are some kinds of stories I want to tell? What are some of the situations I want to talk Vo into? Okay, time for a listener question. This one comes from the capital of Canada, Ottawa. Hi, this is Gloria Guns, longtime follower of your work and first time question asker. I admire the way that you've been able to ask for feedback on your work. And I'm wondering, do you have any tips to share about how to seek feedback and also importantly, how to gracefully receive constructive criticism of, about your work? Thanks, Gloria. And also, thank you for the great music for the podcast. I can't stress enough. It's so much better because of that. Asking people to give you feedback on your work can be kind of awkward, in particular because it makes a lot of people feel really put on the spot and they start worrying like, oh, if I say anything too negative, will the writer react poorly? How fast am I going to get this back to them? And what if I just don't feel like it? How do I refuse them? For me, as a writer who likes to get feedback at many stages of his projects, it was a real game changer to just try and remember all the stuff I mentioned uh, to you right now and you know, putting myself in the shoes of the listener. And so I was like, OK, I'm going to give people like a little three point guarantee. You know, I will give them an out. I will say point one. If you don't ever read this thing and get back to me, that's 
fine. Point two, I will not harass you. This request is the one time I will mention it. So that's another thing people worry, oh, is he going to be bugging me all the time? And finally, I would say, if you do get back to me, however, of course, I would love to hear your thoughts. Don't worry, I have a mature relationship with constructive criticism. Putting in this little three-point guarantee, as I would jokingly refer to it, made me feel better about asking, and I believe made other people feel better about being asked. A few of them did get back to me and say as much, so hey, there you go. It, two important things to remember if you take this approach and use it yourself, which obviously you're welcome to do, actually not bugging the person about, you know, have you read it? Have you read it? Like, you got to keep your word about that promise. And actually not doing it will build credibility. There has been more than one occasion where because I stuck to my words and my little guarantee, a person who didn't help me out with that first request because they got busy, whatever, who cares? They owe you nothing. Let's remember that. They owe you nothing unless you're paying them. But that's a whole other relationship, of course. Uh, they believed me when I sent them another request down the line. And they were like, yeah, you know, he isn't going to bug me. And he, yeah, he's probably therefore going to follow through on the other stuff about like having a mature relationship with constructive criticism. OK. And then they came back and they helped me out. So I, you know, hey, it worked out right. Something I still struggle with even now with my little guarantee and feeling much better about asking for help is not letting anxiety make me overdo it. Like when I put that little guarantee in there, I keep it pretty concise and I avoid apologizing. Like, sorry to bother you. Sorry to ask you for things. Sorry, sorry. Don't hit me, dad. Uh, whoa. Did I have a breakthrough right there? No, my dad never hit me. He's great. Anyway, <laughs> the point is don't be too intense. Don't be long winded. Don't apologize a lot because that can be really off putting in its own way. And I'd like to tell you that since I started doing my little three point guarantee routine that I've never done this ever again. But you know what? You're human. You're fallible. No matter what little tips and tricks you've got you know, up your sleeve. Just recently, I kind of embarrassed myself asking someone, uh, you know, DMing them over Twitter to check out the pilot episode, an early draft for this very podcast. And I wrote it late in the evening. I was tired. I was a little hungry. I had a lot of other stressful things going on in my life. And then the person that kind of got built up in my head because I see them posting a lot about being very busy, but I also really respected their intelligence. So I really wanted to hear what they had to say. And ah, I wrote like a way too much. I my, my guarantee plus like a whole bunch of other stuff. And their response was literally like, I'm just a person. <laughs> <laughs> and also, what is the podcast even about? Like, I didn't even tell them what it was about. <laughs> it was so bad. And I and I was like, well, ha 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 And I tried to sort of like dial it back and like own my you know anxiety that I had expressed and then told them what the podcast was about. And then I never got a response. And that's fair. They don't owe me anything. But gosh, I could have done without making myself feel really embarrassed. <laughs> To the other half of your question, Gloria, about a receiving notes and keeping cool about it, well, I would come back to something I've just said, actually, which is remember, nobody owes you a damn thing. You know, if you're paying someone to do like a story editing pass on your stuff, that is a whole nother story. I won't get into that right now. But if you're just asking buddies and acquaintances to like check out your thing and let you know their thoughts, then you need to accept that you might not actually even receive any notes to get potentially mad about. And that's important to make your peace with. Another thing that will help you receive notes more gracefully is to not put all the pressure on one human being. Ask more than one person for advice or for you know feedback on your thing, and that will reduce the stakes of any one person's set of feedback being the big decider on your stuff. Something else to consider if you get a bunch of notes that make you feel really like bad or get your back up or whatever is, you know, did you choose the right person? Did you ask somebody that your work, this particular story or whatever the heck it is, would actually appeal to? You know, I made this mistake again, you know, looking at the uh, pilot episode of the podcast, the early drafts of that. I was kind of high off of really positive feedback from some other people. So I thought, you know what? Heck, I'm going to send it to this one person who is not really in the age range that I'm imagining will be into this. Not really someone who cares much <laughs> about writing. Um, but, you know, uh, why not? And I got an email back eventually that was just unrelenting negativity and missing various points that I'd made or misunderstanding them in ways that like I had made those points very clear. Like maybe maybe I hadn't made them as clear as they could have been. Who knows? But I felt pretty confident given how many other people had understood them that this person had not. And I just thought, well, what did you expect, buddy? You know, I read those words and I still felt that little like in my chest, you know, seeing a whole lot of negativity directed to something I'd done. You can't fight that sometimes. But I very quickly got over it just by telling myself, well, you buffoon. Oliver, why did you send it to that person in the first place? Do actually try and think about your target audience, as it were, for people to give you feedback on the project. Finally, I would say there is a kind of spiritual flip side to remember, nobody owes you a damn thing, you dumb writer, 
which is remember you're in control, you big, awesome, cool writer. <laughs> remember that you don't have to take any notes you don't want to. You are entitled to disagree with any negative or even positive feedback that you receive from someone. You know, be careful. Don't disregard it. If you get the same negative note from like three separate people, maybe there's something to it. Another reason, of course, to ask more than one person for feedback. But yeah, at the end of the day, you're in the driver's seat. And especially if this is personal writing, like you're writing a novel the way I am, of course you want it to succeed, yada, yada. But at the end of the day, the stakes are probably not as high as they might feel in your guts when someone says something negative or whatever. It's all good, man. You're in control. So I'm writing a novel features original music by Gloria Guns and is hosted by yours truly, Oliver Brackenbury. If you'd like to submit a question, then please email it to so I'm writing a novel at gmail.com. Bonus points if you record yourself and send me an MP3, I can cut into the show. Doesn't have to be fancy. Using your phone is fine, just keep it clear and concise. You can also holler at the show on Twitter. Look for at so I'm writing a novel. Please consider sharing the show with anybody who might like it, leaving a review on iTunes, and checking out patreon.com slash so I'm writing a novel. Patrons get to be thanked in the final novel, listen to episodes of the podcast a week early, and even enjoy a bonus podcast called So I Wrote a Novel, where I read and comment on chapters of my previous works, starting with my first novel, Junkyard Leopard. Thanks for hanging out with me, and I'll see you soon.